These transabdominal sagittal images of the same woman before and after urination illustrate the effect of bladder filling on the position of the uterus. When the bladder is full, the uterus tilts posteriorly to form a 90 degrees or greater angle in relation to the vaginal stripe. When the bladder empties, the uterus assumes an anteriorly tilted or antiverted position in relation to the vaginal stripe. On endovaginal ultrasound, the ovaries may appear like chocolate chip cookies. These sonographic chocolate chips are ovarian follicles at various stages of development in a woman of childbearing age. A normal ovary is the size of an olive and is located anteromedial to the iliac vessels and adjacent to the endovaginal transducer. Normal ovaries can measure up to 5 centimeters in length, 3 centimeters in width, and 2 centimeters in thickness in post-pubertal patients. While loops of bowel may be mistaken for ovaries, such an error can be avoided by understanding the anticipated location of the ovary in relation to the iliac vessels and transducer. Also, loops of bowel will exhibit peristalsis, or undulation of their inner walls, while ovaries do not. The endovaginal sagittal view allows one to see the bladder, the uterus, the endometrial stripe, and anterior and posterior cul-de-sacs. One cannot visualize the vaginal stripe because the transducer is within the vaginal vault. In general, the endovaginal approach provides a higher resolution image of the uterus than does the transabdominal technique. Following evaluation of the pelvis in a sagittal plane, return the transducer to a midline or home base. Here, one can see the endometrial stripe stretching out in long axis across the screen. Performing this step will facilitate subsequent rotation of the probe into a coronal imaging plane. The endovaginal coronal imaging plane provides a short axis view of the uterus. The endometrial stripe is seen in short axis and stretches from the left to right across the ultrasound screen, which indicates the probe is slicing across the uterus towards its fundus. This patient has a relatively full bladder which degrades endovaginal image quality. Although the structures found posterior to the uterus look like ovaries, they're actually loops of bowel. Loops of bowel have a characteristic appearance on ultrasound, hypoechoic outer walls and hyperechoic undulating inner walls. At approximately six weeks gestational age, the fetal pole, or embryo, develops cardiac activity, which appears as flickering within the fetal pole and is now considered a live intrauterine pregnancy. Any embryo measuring more than five millimeters must have identifiable cardiac activity on endovaginal ultrasound to be considered viable. As the embryo continues to grow, about one millimeter each day, the yolk sac will shrink and the amniotic sac will grow outwards towards the gestational sac. Following insertion of the probe, orient the probe indicator towards the ceiling or 12 o'clock position. This will enable imaging in a sagittal plane. In this position, one initially sees the cervix and the lower uterine segment. On the transabdominal transverse view, the left side of the image, identified by the probe indicator on the ultrasound window, corresponds with the patient's anatomic right side. The image orientation is similar to an axial CT scan revealing both right and left and anterior and posterior dimensions. In the transverse view, the full bladder appears rectangular and the uterus appears round. On the transverse view, one can also see the anterior cul-de-sac and posterior cul-de-sac in short axis views. On the transabdominal sagittal view, fanning from side to side reveals the uterus in various longitudinal projections. When in the midline, the endometrial stripe is visible and this projection is sometimes referred to as home base. If the ultrasonographer gets lost or is unclear about their probe position, returning to this home base view provides a consistent anatomic reference point. On the transabdominal sagittal view, one can visualize the bladder, uterine fundus, cervix, anterior cul-de-sac, posterior cul-de-sac, and occasionally loops of bowel. When obtaining a transverse view in a patient with an empty bladder, 
the uterus tilts anteriorly and consume a peculiar configuration. The uterine fundus overlies, or is on top of, the bladder while the underlying cervix can be seen below the bladder. It is as if the overlying uterine fundus and underlying cervix form a clamp around the empty bladder. On the trans-abdominal transverse view, one can also see the vaginal vault and rectum. This is how a complex adnexal mass appears. We can see this very large adnexal mass that's in excess of 10 centimeters has various components to it. Some components have a thick fibrous band-like structure running through it, while other components appear to have some echogenic debris uh, floating around it. This is how a complex adnexal mass would appear in ultrasound. The uterus is seen over here off to the side, suggesting this is a right adnexal complex mass. Some of these masses get so large that they're too large to view on endovaginal ultrasound, and one may use instead transabdominal ultrasound in order to follow the anatomic progression of the mass throughout the pelvis. In this clinical case, a young female patient presents with left lower quadrant abdominal pain and has a positive urine pregnancy test. On her endovaginal ultrasound, one can see the uterus and the presence of a gestational sac with a yolk sac and a fetal pole within the uterus. Adjacent to the uterus, in the left adnexa is a cystic structure. It appears to be within the ovary as ovarian stromal tissue is visible adjacent to the cyst. This structure most likely represents a corpus luteum cyst in a patient who also has an intrauterine pregnancy. Corpus luteum cysts are the most common masses found in early pregnancy and on ultrasound. They are usually unilocular with thin walls. In this clinical case, a young female patient presents with right lower quadrant pain and has a negative urine pregnancy test. On her endovaginal ultrasound, one can see the uterus and the bladder and a large six centimeter cystic structure adjacent to the uterus. This hemorrhagic ovarian cyst contains gelatinous clotted blood which appears isoechoic on ultrasound similar to organ like the spleen. When a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst ruptures, it may cause lower abdominal pain and peritonitis. This endovaginal ultrasound shows an empty uterus and a right-sided adnexal mass that demonstrates the ring of fire sign with power Doppler imaging. The presence of this extrauterine gestational sac, which contains a yolk sac, is a definitive sign of an ectopic pregnancy. On this endovaginal ultrasound, fanning slowly through the uterus reveals that it was empty. Adjacent to the uterus, there is substantial free intraperitoneal fluid in both the anterior and posterior cul-de-sacs. An empty uterus and free intraperitoneal fluid should raise suspicion for an ectopic pregnancy. On further sonographic evaluation, a gestational sac with a thick concentric echogenic ring that measures at least 5 millimeters in internal diameter is seen adjacent to but outside of the uterus. Within this gestational sac is a fetal pole with cardiac activity. Confirming the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy or extrauterine gestation. In this transabdominal pelvic ultrasound, the uterus is visualized in the sagittal plane and the bladder is seen on the right side of the screen. Fanning through the uterus reveals an intrauterine gestation and when the transducer is rotated into the transverse plane, a fetal pole is visible within the gestational sac. On further sonographic evaluation of the right adnexa, a second pregnancy is also visible. This meets criteria for an extrauterine gestation. In other words, it's an extrauterine gestation that contains a yolk sac.
The presence of simultaneous intrauterine and extrauterine pregnancies is known as a heterotopic pregnancy. The incidence of heterotopic pregnancy approaches 1 to 3% in women undergoing infertility treatment. This case demonstrates the importance of thoroughly evaluating the entire pelvis each time one performs pelvic ultrasound, prematurely concluding the procedure after finding the intrauterine pregnancy would have missed this potentially life-threatening diagnosis. The transabdominal pelvic ultrasound shown on the left and the endovaginal ultrasound shown on the right both reveal a very prominent endometrial stripe within the uterus. In fact, on the endovaginal ultrasound, reverberation artifact is visible due to the presence of a foreign body, or in this particular case, an intrauterine device. On pelvic ultrasound, the IUD appears very hyperechoic with prominent artifacts. In this endovaginal ultrasound examination, one sees the bladder, the uterus, and an intrauterine pregnancy. However, adjacent to the intrauterine pregnancy is an artifact from an intrauterine device. This patient has both an IUP and an IUD, which is creating artifact and shadowing on pelvic ultrasound. On pelvic ultrasound, there are several reliable sonographic signs of an abnormal intrauterine pregnancy or embryonic demise. The earliest sign of embryonic demise is a large, empty gestational sac. If a gestational sac has a diameter of greater than or equal to 10 millimeters, but does not contain a yolk sac, the intrauterine pregnancy is abnormal and is referred to as a blighted ovum. This endovaginal ultrasound reveals an abnormal IUP. The gestational sac has a thick concentric echogenic ring and it has a diameter of at least 10 millimeters that lies within the uterus. However, the gestational sac is empty. It does not contain a fetal pole, and therefore the IUP is abnormal. Another reliable sign of an abnormal IUP is a large fetal pole without cardiac activity. If a fetal pole has a crumb run blade greater than or equal to 5 millimeters and does not have cardiac activity, the intrauterine pregnancy is abnormal. This endovaginal ultrasound reveals an abnormal IUP. The fetal pole has a crown rump length of at least five millimeters and lies within the gestational sac. However, cardiac activity is absent. This endovaginal ultrasound reveals a fetal pole with a crown rump length of at least five millimeters lying within the gestational sac. However, the absence of cardiac activity indicates that this is an abnormal IUP. Now there is a small fibroid in the left upper quadrant of the uterus. This anechoic area outside of the gestational sac on the right side of the image over here likely represents a subchorionic hemorrhage right here. The anechoic area on the top left side of the screen also appears to be subchorionic in nature, but is almost completely echo-free except for one area. This area likely represents an older subchorionic collection. However, it could also represent a fluid collection that is not blood. This pelvic ultrasound reveals a uterus containing a gestational sac, amnion, a yolk sac, here, and an adjacent fetal pole. Slowly fanning through the fetus does not reveal any cardiac activity. Since the fetal pole measures much larger than 5 millimeters in crown rump length, this is an abnormal IUP. This pelvic ultrasound also reveals the presence of a crescent-shaped hypochoic material anterior to the gestational sac. This represents subchorionic hemorrhage, bleeding between the endometrium and the chorionic membrane. 
This endovaginal pelvic ultrasound was taken with the transducer held in a sagittal plane with the probe indicator pointed towards the ceiling. The transducer was gently pushed towards the floor to obtain this view of the uterus. So this endovaginal ultrasound reveals an early IUP. The gestational sac is at least 5 millimeters in internal diameter and has a thick concentric echogenic ring. This gestational sac lies within the uterus and has both a yolk sac and a fetal pole. This endovaginal ultrasound reveals a live intrauterine pregnancy. The gestational sac is at least 5 millimeters in internal diameter and has a thick concentric echogenic ring and lies within the uterus. The IUP is alive because the gestational sac contains a fetal pole with cardiac activity. The three ultrasound images, two endovaginal on the left and one transabdominal on the right, all reveal the same findings, an intrauterine mass composed of multiple, diffuse, irregular, hypochoic vesicles or grape-like clusters. These classic findings are consistent with gestational trophoblastic disease or a molar pregnancy. In this transabdominal pelvic ultrasound, one can see a large, full bladder, and the uterus is behind the bladder. Zooming in on the structure behind the uterus reveals a 1.5 by 2.1 centimeter ovarian cyst. Due to their small sizes, ovarian cysts may not be visualized, if at all, on transabdominal ultrasound. However, in this case, the bladder and the uterus served as acoustic windows allowing the ovarian cyst to be visualized. However, it is generally better to view the ovaries and ovarian pathology with an endovaginal transducer. In this particular patient, the ovary and ovarian cyst appeared posterior to the uterus on ultrasound. One explanation might be that the patient's uterus has deviated slightly to the right, as not every uterus lies in the midline. Another explanation might be that the ovaries untethered as occurs in multiparous women and has migrated immediately towards the midline. In this endovaginal ultrasound, the adnexal tissue is visualized, and in particular the ovary and the ovarian stromal tissue. Adjacent to the ovary are loops of bowel floating in free fluid. Two cystic structures are present here and here, and there is some reverberation artifact on one of the cysts that measures 2 by 2 centimeters. These are two simple ovarian cysts, and the adjacent free intraperitoneal fluid may have come from a ruptured ovarian cyst. This endovaginal ultrasound shows an adnexal mass that demonstrates the ring of fire sign when power flow Doppler is applied. The presence of this extra uterine gestational sac, which contains a yolk sac, is a definitive sign of an ectopic pregnancy. In this endovaginal view ultrasound clip, the uterine fundus is posteriorly tilted. As one rotates into the coronal plane, free intraperitoneal fluid is visible to the anatomic right of the empty uterus. This empty uterus and the presence of free intraperitoneal fluid should raise suspicion for an ectopic pregnancy. As one images the right adnexa, a mass with a thick echogenic ring is visible. At first glance, using PowerFlow Doppler imaging, a ring of fire sign seems to be present. The ring of fire results from increased placental blood flow to a rapidly growing extrauterine gestational sac. However, the image appears to show a follicular structure adjacent to the area in question suggesting this is a corpus in the ovary. A more complete scan through the adnexa is required before making more statements of certainty regarding an adnexal mass versus ovarian cyst. Again, the ring of fire is a nonspecific sign that is not unique to ectopic pregnancies and may also be seen with a corpus luteum cyst. In this endovaginal ultrasound performed on a patient with a positive pregnancy test, the uterus is empty and the right adnexa contains a concentric 
hyperchoic structure. This ring-like structure, also known as a tubal ring, has a bright, echogenic, round, and symmetric wall, thereby differentiating it from a corpus luteum or other ovarian cysts. The tubal ring also appears to contain a fetal pole, so it does meet definitive criteria for an ectopic pregnancy. Further sonographic evaluation of this patient also reveals free intraperitoneal pelvic fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac and adjacent to the tubal ring. In this patient with an empty uterus and two sonographic signs suggested for an ectopic pregnancy, i.e. free intraperitoneal fluid and a tubal ring, the likelihood of an ectopic pregnancy is very high. The embryo can be recognized by high-resolution transvaginal ultrasound at 2 to 3 millimeters in size, but cardiac activity will be consistently seen when the embryo reaches 7 millimeters in length or greater. First cardiac activity should be seen at 6 to 6 and a half weeks. The appearance of cardiac activity which appears as flickering within the fetal pole constitutes a live intrauterine pregnancy. These characteristics are shown in this accompanying ultrasound image. Cardiac rate increases rapidly in early gestation, being around 100 to 115 beats per minute prior to 6 weeks, rising to 145 to 170 beats per minute at 8 weeks, and dropping down to a plateau of 137 to 144 beats per minute after 9 weeks gestation. Implantation of a gestational sac in a cesarean section scar is referred to as cesarean scar implantation. This condition is technically not an ectopic pregnancy as the gestational sac is within the uterine cavity. The gestational sac becomes embedded within the myometrium rather than the endometrium. Cesarean scar implantation has been found to be histopathophysiologically indistinguishable from placenta accreta and may represent a stage in the disease continuum. Later in gestation, cesarean scar implantation can lead to severe placental abnormalities, rupture of the gestational sac, and even uterine rupture. The diagnosis of a cesarean scar implantation is made when a gestational sac is noted by ultrasound to be located in the lower uterine segment in or near a cesarean section scar. Commonly, a thin myometrium between the bladder wall and gestational sac is also noted. The accompanying ultrasound clip shows a transvaginal ultrasound along a mid-sagittal plane of the uterus magnified at the level of the lower uterine segment. Note the presence of a gestational sac in the anatomic location of the cesarean section scar, thus representing a cesarean scar implantation. The gestational sac is elongated and appears tethered to the cesarean scar site in the uterus. Color Doppler shows embryonic cardiac activity. The ampullary and isthmic sections of the fallopian tube account for the largest proportion of ectopic pregnancies. In this transvaginal ultrasound clip of the right anexa, a normal ovary is seen and identified by the presence of multiple small follicles. Note the anatomic location of the ovary overlying the internal iliac or hypogastric vessels. As the ultrasound transvaginal probe is moved into the medial aspect of the right adnexa, an ectopic pregnancy is seen in the ampullary segment of the fallopian tube. Note that the ectopic pregnancy is round and more echogenic than the adjacent ovary. Other rare tubal locations include the fimbrial end of the tube or the corneal interstitial end of the tube. Corneal ectopic pregnancies typically present at a more advanced stage in gestation and are commonly associated with severe hemorrhage and maternal shock at the time of presentation if undetected before rupture. This transvaginal ultrasound clip represents a sweep from the anatomic right to the anatomic left parasagittal uterus. The anatomic right parasagittal and mid-sagittal views of the uterus appear normal. Note the presence of a gestational sac in the left parasagittal view located in the corneal segment of the uterus. Note that the ectopic pregnancy is located within the uterus at the corneal level and outside of the endometrial cavity. The ectopic pregnancy has the characteristic sonographic appearance of a bright echogenic rim with an anechoic center. A small amount of posterior cul-de-sac fluid is also seen. 
Cervical ectopic pregnancies occur in less than 1% of all ectopic pregnancies and are typically diagnosed by transvaginal ultrasound. In this transvaginal ultrasound clip, a magnified sagittal view of the cervix is shown with a gestational sac located within the endocervical canal, thus representing a cervical ectopic pregnancy. The ectopic gestational sac has an echogenic rim and shows an embryo with cardiac activity. The cul-de-sac appears normal with no fluid. When detecting an embryonic or fetal heartbeat with a diagnostic ultrasound system, the AIUM recommends initially using M-mode because the time average acoustic intensity delivered to the embryo or fetus is lower with M-mode than with spectral Doppler. Documentation of cardiac activity can occur by saving an ultrasound clip of the embryonic or fetal heart. The second step involves using the transvaginal technique to assess the anterior and posterior cul-de-sacs for the presence of free fluid. The presence of fluid in the cul-de-sacs may represent the presence of blood from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy or a ruptured ovarian cyst. Low velocity color Doppler can be used to confirm the absence of vascular flow within the blood clots. It is important to note that the presence of fluid in the cul-de-sac in a patient with a suspected ectopic pregnancy should be a concern because of the possibility of intra-abdominal bleeding, and this information should be considered in the overall management of the patient. Bear in mind that trace amounts of physiologic free fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac may represent normal findings. The occurrence of small amounts of free fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac of healthy patients has been long described. The exact cause of this physiologic free fluid has been attributed to multiple factors. The volume of detected free fluid seems to peak during the time surrounding ovulation. This fluid is typically detected using transvaginal ultrasound. The described volumes of physiologic free fluid range between 5 and 21 mLs. Conversely, free fluid in the anterior cul-de-sac has been traditionally deemed pathologic until proven otherwise. This transvaginal ultrasound clip represents a sagittal sweep of the pelvis, showing the uterus in mid-sagittal view and a significant amount of free fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac and surrounding the uterus. The endometrium is also shown during the sweep and appears normal. A blood clot is shown in the posterior cul-de-sac towards the end of the clip. The pelvic fluid in this case was related to intra-abdominal bleeding from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Evaluating the cul-de-sacs for the presence of free fluid is an important step when an ectopic pregnancy is suspected. The ultrasound characteristics of a hemorrhagic cyst include excellent sound transmission, a thin reticular lacy pattern, temporal changes with serial ultrasound examination, a discrete fluid level, and jiggling movement upon corresponding manipulation. The internal hemorrhagic cyst contents should demonstrate the absence of flow upon Doppler interrogation. A single echogenic mass representing clotted blood should be evident when the cyst is sonographically examined during the clot retraction stage of evolution. The ovary should return to normal with a gradual resolution of internal changes upon serial ultrasound examination. This ultrasound clip reveals a hemorrhagic cyst at the stage of blood clot retraction. Note that the clot has retracted to one side of the cyst. When probed by the transvaginal transducer as shown here, the retracted clot jiggles due to its soft characteristics. As noted earlier, the presence of simultaneous intrauterine and extrauterine pregnancies is known as heterotopic pregnancy. This case demonstrates the importance of thoroughly evaluating the entire pelvis each time one performs pelvic ultrasound. Prematurely concluding an ultrasound examination after finding an intrauterine pregnancy would have missed this potentially life-threatening condition. This clip shows a transvaginal ultrasound of the uterus in adnexa with color Doppler imaging. An intrauterine gestational sac with a yolk sac and embryonic cardiac activity is noted. The color Doppler box is applied over the adnexa, showing an ectopic tubal gestational sac. Note the characteristic shape of the ectopic gestation as round, echogenic, with an anechoic center, or donut-like. Color Doppler does not typically help differentiate ectopic pregnancy from a corpus luteum, as both typically demonstrate vascular flow. This accompanying transvaginal ultrasound was performed at six and a half weeks gestational age. The image view is magnified and a gestational sac with a characteristic echogenic rim is visible. A yolk sac is noted within the gestational sac and a fetal pole with a heartbeat is noted. 
This constitutes definitive evidence of a live intrauterine pregnancy. When measuring the CRL, the operator should use the mean of three discrete measurements obtained in a mid-sagittal plane. The CRL increases rapidly at a rate of approximately one millimeter per day. An approximate formula to calculate gestational age from the CRL is gestational age in days equals CRL in millimeters plus 42. However, this may not be needed since most ultrasound equipment has integrated software that allows gestational age determination upon measurement of CRL or other biometric parameters. It is recommended to observe the following parameters when dating a first trimester pregnancy less than 14 weeks by CRL. For pregnancies less than 9 weeks gestation, a discrepancy between menstrual or gestational age and sonographic age of more than 5 days from last menstrual period is an appropriate reason for changing the expected date of delivery or EDD. For pregnancies between 9 and 13 and 6 7 weeks gestation, a discrepancy of more than 7 days should result in a change in the expected date of delivery. Molar pregnancy, also known as hydatidiform mole, is an abnormal pregnancy resulting in a benign growth of the placenta as it develops into an abnormal mass of cysts. Molar pregnancy is classified as a non-invasive, complete or partial mole, an invasive mole, a choriocarcinoma, or a placental site trophoblastic tumor. Complete molar pregnancy occurs when all of the fertilized egg's chromosomes come from the father. This happens when the maternal chromosomes are inactivated and the paternal chromosomes are duplicated. In a complete molar pregnancy, there is no embryo or normal placental tissue. In a partial or incomplete molar pregnancy, there is triploidy with one set of chromosomes from the mother and two sets from the father. In a partial molar pregnancy, there is an abnormal embryo and possibly some normal placental tissue. Symptoms of molar pregnancy include bleeding, severe nausea and vomiting, pain, and passage of cysts. Molar pregnancy can result in high blood pressure and preeclampsia. There are several well-established specific sonographic findings of failed pregnancy in the first trimester that, when noted, are specific enough and can establish the diagnosis without a need for a follow-up examination. These include, number one, a CRL of equal to or greater than 7 millimeters with no demonstrable cardiac activity. Number two, a mean gestational sac diameter equal to or greater than 25 millimeters without an embryo. Number three, the absence of an embryo with cardiac activity on a repeat ultrasound scan performed two weeks or more after an initial scan demonstrated a gestational sac without a yolk sac. And number four, the absence of an embryo with cardiac activity on a repeat ultrasound scan performed 11 days or more after an initial scan that demonstrated a gestational sac containing a yolk sac. This ultrasound clip represents a transvaginal ultrasound at 9 weeks gestation. Note the presence of a yolk sac that is large in diameter and an embryo. The embryo measures 8 millimeters in CRL with no cardiac activity demonstrated. These findings confirm the presence of a failed intrauterine pregnancy or a missed abortion. This ultrasound clip shows a sagittal view of a uterus with a gestational sac and a large subchorionic bleed. Note that the blood clot is of significant size and fills almost the entire uterine cavity. In this case, no embryonic cardiac activity could be demonstrated. This large subchorionic hemorrhage resulted in a failed pregnancy. As noted earlier, larger sizes of hemorrhage, earlier gestational age at the time of hemorrhage, and advanced maternal age have been linked to higher rates of failed pregnancy. The accompanying transvaginal ultrasound clip represents a mid-sagittal plane of the uterus showing two gestational sacs within the endometrial cavity indicating twins. The gestational sacs are side by side and are separated by a thick dividing membrane. The presence of a thick dividing membrane in early gestation confirms a dichorionic diamniotic twin gestation. The transabdominal female pelvic ultrasound shown on the left and the transvaginal ultrasound shown on the right both reveal a very prominent endometrial stripe within the uterus. In fact, on the transvaginal ultrasound, reverberation artifact is visible due to the presence of a foreign body, in this particular case, an intrauterine device or IUD. 
On the transabdominal ultrasound, the IUD appears very hyperechoic with prominent artifacts. When obtaining a transverse view in a patient with an empty bladder, the uterus tilts anteriorly and can assume a peculiar configuration. The uterine fundus overlies, that is, is on top of, the bladder, while the underlying cervix can be seen below the bladder. It is as if the overlying uterine fundus and underlying cervix form a clamp around the empty bladder. In the transabdominal transverse view, one can also see the vaginal vault and rectum. Sonographic characteristics of malignant and borderline adnexal masses include irregularities in the cyst capsule, thick septations, solid papillary projections, and vascularity seen with Doppler inspection. While these sonographic characteristics should heighten suspicion for malignancy, they are not sufficiently predictive enough to enable a definitive determination of whether a mass is benign or malignant. Therefore, ovarian cysts are often classified into indeterminate or malignant, that is, cysts with characteristics worrisome for possible malignancy, categories based upon the aforementioned characteristics. The accompanying transvaginal ultrasound clip demonstrates an adnexal mass in a pregnant patient in the third trimester of pregnancy. Note the presence of solid papillary projections and the increased vascular flow demonstrated with color Doppler. The patient underwent surgical resection of the mass and final pathology revealed stage 1 serous cyst adenocarcinoma. Borderline tumors of the adnexa and invasive malignant adnexal masses have overlapping sonographic characteristics. Since borderline tumors have gross morphological characteristics that also overlap with a variety of benign ovarian tumors, the utility of radiographic imaging, including ultrasound, to definitively identify borderline tumors is limited. Surgical resection and histopathologic examination is the most definitive means by which borderline tumors are identified. Step 4. Repeat the same maneuver on the anatomic left side of the patient to image the left ovary. Following the previously described anatomic landmark along a transverse imaging plane will help localize the ipsilateral ovary. This patient's anatomic left ovary can be seen in the accompanying transvaginal ultrasound clip, which demonstrates the ovarian ligament leading to the left ovary. While not seen in this clip, once an ovary is visualized, it is important to scan the ovary in a transverse plane then rotate your transducer 90 degrees clockwise into a sagittal plane and scan the ovary from side to side. Step 3. While maintaining a transverse orientation, angle the transducer towards the anatomic right side of the patient, looking for the right ovary. The handle of the transducer should get close to or touch the patient's anatomic left inner thigh. Follow the soft tissue anatomic landmark consisting of the ovarian ligament, fallopian tube, and mesosalpins to the right ovary. The right ovary should come into view overlying the right internal iliac or hypogastric vessels. This anatomic landmark can be traced from each side of the uterus and leads to the corresponding ovary as demonstrated in the accompanying transvaginal ultrasound clip. This accompanying transvaginal ultrasound clip demonstrates a follicle. The characteristic finding of a follicle is an anechoic sac that contains an ovum and its encasing cells. Note the size of the follicle is measuring less than 3 centimeters. As mentioned previously, on grayscale ultrasound, retained products of conception typically appear as a distinct echogenic mass within the endometrial cavity. The accompanying grayscale ultrasound clip obtained in a mid-sagittal view of the uterus demonstrates an echogenic endometrial mass suggestive of retained products of conception. Note the mixed echogenicity of the endometrial mass. The accompanying grayscale ultrasound clip obtained in a mid-sagittal view of the uterus in a different patient demonstrates an echogenic endometrial mass that extends into the myometrium. The mass has areas of increased and mixed echogenicity, suggestive of retained products of conception. The extension into the myometrium suggests that this may represent a retained focal placenta accreta. Fetal breathing movements are defined as one or more episodes of rhythmic fetal breathing movements of 30 seconds or more within a 30-minute period. The presence of normal fetal breathing movements makes fetal acidemia with a pH of less than 7.2 unlikely.
Fetal movements are defined as three or more discrete trunk movements within a 30-minute period. Fetal tone is defined as one or more episodes of extension with return to flexion of a fetal extremity or opening or closing of a hand within a 30-minute period. Adequate amniotic fluid volume is defined by an MVP of amniotic fluid of greater than 2 cm. Amniotic fluid measurements should only be taken in cord loop free pockets of amniotic fluid. As noted earlier, the biophysical profile is performed with real-time ultrasound over a period of 30 minutes. Each of the five components of the biophysical profile is scored as 2 when present and 0 when absent. The score is thus added and a normal biophysical profile is defined by a score of 10 or 8. A score of 6 is equivocal and a score of 4, 2 or 0 is abnormal. Cervical length sonographic assessment has been shown to be safe in pregnancy even in the presence of preterm labor or premature rupture of membranes. Furthermore, sonographic assessment of cervical length is typically well tolerated by pregnant women with minimal pain or discomfort. The technique of cervical length measurement is well described and involves the following steps. Ask the patient to empty her bladder. Use a transvaginal scanning approach to obtain a mid-sagittal plane view of the cervix. Ensure that the anterior and posterior cervical segments are equal in size. Enlarge the image to ensure that the cervix occupies about 75% of the screen. Identify the external and internal cervical os and endocervical canal. Measure cervical length along the endocervical canal using linear measurements. If the endocervical canal is curved, use two linear measurements and add them together. Apply suprapubic pressure for about 15 seconds to assess for cervical funneling. Assess the cervix for 3 to 5 minutes. Obtain three measurements and report the shortest one. Cervical funneling results from dilation of the internal segment of the cervical canal and cervical length shortening. Clinical management is typically dictated by the functional length of the cervix rather than the presence or absence of cervical funneling. The fetal heart can often be seen as a four-chambered structure by 13 to 15 weeks gestation and by 16 weeks gestation all four cardiac chambers should be clearly evident. The chamber walls should have a hyperechoic appearance which contrasts with the anechoic appearance of blood within the chambers. The chambers are typically relatively symmetric in size and are separated by bright hyperechoic atrial and interventricular septate. The fetal spine and thoracic ribs assist with orientation and help identify the anterior posterior axis of the thorax. The cardiac axis is defined by the angle of the interventricular septum with respect to the anterior posterior diameter of the thorax. The normal cardiac axis is 45 plus or minus 20 degrees. The heart is normally rotated to the left and is almost entirely within the left chest. An altered cardiac axis is often an indicator of pathology. Common chest lesions include diaphragmatic hernia, cystic and hyperechoic lesions of the lung such as congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation, extra lobar sequestration, and congenital hydrothorax and pleural effusions. Congenital hydrothorax and pleural effusions may be an isolated finding or may be associated with anasarca. In both instances, if the pleural fluid collection is large enough, lung compression with resultant pulmonary hypoplasia may result. Sonographic characteristics of pleural effusion include an anechoic fluid collection within the thoracic cavity surrounding the lungs and often outlining the heart. Head circumference measurement often follows biparietal diameter measurement. This approach allows the operator to utilize the same relative imaging plane and caliper positions used for biparietal diameter measurement, which expedites the process. If a biparietal diameter image is used to measure head circumference, one must ensure that the plane of section was perpendicular to and included the thalami, third ventricle, and cavum septipellucidae. Importantly, a subtle adjustment to one of the caliper positions used for biparietal diameter measurement is required for measuring head circumference. The lower, more distal caliper icon used to measure biparietal diameter should be moved to the outer bony edge of the parietal skull. The head circumference option should be selected, and a caliper will appear on the monitor. Position the caliper along the outer edge of the proximal parietal bone.
the caliper icon should roughly align with the level of the thalami, as this is typically the widest skull diameter. Position the second caliper icon along the outer edge of the opposing parietal bone. Ensure the caliper measurements capture the widest possible skull diameter while observing the aforementioned anatomic landmarks. Next, position the ellipse along the occipital frontal diameter skull contour and set it. The ellipse method allows the operator to expand the ellipse over the cranium, typically by initially fixing the biparietal diameter and occipital frontal diameter, which then generates a head circumference calculation. If the umbilical cord or umbilical vessels appear tethered to the membranes at the level of the internal os or in the lower uterine segment along the cervix, vasa previa should also be diagnosed. It is important to rule out a funic or cord presentation. A funic presentation is a type of fetal presentation that is diagnosed when the umbilical cord is the leading presenting part of pregnancy. It can be diagnosed by asking the patient to move around and seeing if the umbilical cord moves in the process. Repeating the transvaginal ultrasound examination at a later date and determining whether the umbilical cord maintains a fixed position will also help confirm a funic presentation. The location of the umbilical cord segment will move with a funic presentation, while the location of the cord segment will not change in vasa previa. 